The NFL season opened with massive viewership numbers, but Sunday was clouded by Tyreek Hill's arrest on the way to his first game. We're also getting a look inside the 49ers front office. The NFL is cracking down on player safety violations, and a legend played her last game. It's Monday, September 9th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, our tuned-in columnist Michael McCarthy joins to discuss some of the big stories in NFL media from the opening week, including the arrest of Tyreek Hill. We're also hearing from San Francisco 49ers executive Brent Schaub in conversation with our newsletter writer David Rumsey on life within the Ascendant team. I also speak with Sports Illustrated Ticket CEO David Lane about where he sees opportunity in that shifting market. First, here are your top headlines. Dolphins star wideout Tyreek Hill was detained by police ahead of Miami's week one home opener in what his agent Drew Rosenhaus called a completely unnecessary move by the Miami PD following a traffic stop. In the video of the incident, Hill is seen on the ground with three police officers surrounding him as they put him in handcuffs. According to Rosenhaus, Hill was trying to reason with the cops by telling them he wants to be a police officer in the future. Hill was cleared to play for Sunday's game. If Scotty Scheffler's arrest ahead of the PGA Championship is any indication of what's to come here, this story should be something that we continue to follow over the next few weeks. Dak Prescott is officially the highest paid player in NFL history. Just a few hours before his season opener against the Cleveland Browns, Adam Schefter broke details of Prescott's new four-year, $240 million contract with $231 million guaranteed, meaning that Dak Prescott will be making at least $57.75 million annually for the next four years. Kendrick Lamar will be the halftime performer for Super Bowl 59. The LA-based rapper has remained in the spotlight for months since his beef started with Drake back in late March, and he's keeping the momentum going. In June, Lamar hosted a show for Juneteenth in which he brought multiple celebrities and athletes on stage for five straight performances of Not Like Us, his brutal diss track against Drake that has over 743 million streams on Spotify. We should expect an even larger spectacle for the halftime show at SB59. Jamar Chase made his season debut against the New England Patriots despite a contract dispute that's lasted for the entire Bengals offseason. Chase has been a hold-in at Bengals training camps, making appearances at the camps, but not practicing with the team. Chase has said that he wants a contract extension, and with fellow wide receivers Justin Jefferson and CeeDee Lamb signing huge contracts, it only makes sense that Chase would want a deal soon. The NCAA settlement that would result in college players getting paid directly by their schools has been sent back to the drawing board after a federal judge raised concerns over the terms of the deal, specifically regarding a clause that would encourage restrictions on booster collectives that could result in some athletes losing out on valuable NIL money. It's important to note that in this new proposal, colleges could pay athletes eight-figure salaries, but the increased restrictions on booster money would take things away from people, in Judge Claudia Wilkins' words, which she says is usually not too popular. FOS College Sports reporter Amanda Kristovich will keep us updated on this story as we learn more over the next few weeks, arguably the most important in college sports history. The NFL's first week was full of huge viewership numbers and no small amount of discord as Tyreek Hill was detained by police on the way to his game. My colleague Mike McCarthy joins us next to talk about that news and his own moment in the spotlight as the host of a front office sports event that brings together some of the biggest names in sports media. That event is tomorrow and Mike joins us right now. Joining me now is Front Office Sports Tuned In columnist Mike McCarthy. Welcome, Mike. Glad to be back, Owen. Yeah, great to have you on. So on Tuesday, you won't just be the Tuned In, tuned in columnist, you'll be the Tuned In host. So <laughs> you and the FOS team have put together you know, a really star-studded event in New York. Uh, tell me what we can expect on Tuesday. Yeah, Tuned In will come to life as a live event. It's our biggest live event ever, Owen, and we've got a powerhouse lineup of speakers to talk everything about sports media. Start with Stephen A. Smith, the biggest single star at ESPN, probably the biggest single star in uh, sports media right now. You've got Burt Madness, who's running content at ESPN. Mark Lazarus of NBC is coming off this huge Olympics and is now starting uh, NFL season. Monica McNutt, Jay Williams, Brian Lawler of Script Sports. I mean, the, the list goes on. It's going to be a fantastic event. You know, you'll be wearing a few hats on Tuesday. I'm sure you'll be running in eight different directions at all times. But 
one of those, uh, you know, those hats is going to be reporter and analyst is as you generally are. So what are you hoping to learn from your guests on Tuesday? Well, I want to get a better read on where this business is going. You know, what's amazing, Owen, is right now it's a, a golden age for a sports TV, right? I mean, sports is the only thing that's holding the cable bundle together. It's really the only thing holding the TV bundle together. But, you know, you've got all these storm clouds coming in. you got streamers coming in, uh, picking up rights. You've got the cable bundle collapsing. You've got a lot of uh, cracks starting to appear. So I really want to get a read on the future of sports media as well as the present. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just the ongoing big question for me, too. And I don't know if, when we're going to get any true answers. But yeah, like sports, yeah, like you said, it's holding together the cable bundle. It's holding together the past. <laughs> but yes. the past is, you know, it's going away, but very slowly. And so what is the future going to be like? Is the NFL going to be worth, you know, $10 billion, $12 billion in 2024 dollars in 10 years? Maybe yeah. more, maybe maybe a lot less. I don't know. I'll tell you one question I'm going to ask everybody there, uh, particularly the ones with TV rights, is now that the NBA got its bag and basically tripled their rights, do they think the NFL is going to reopen in negotiations? Because they have an opt-out clause, uh, Owen, within seven years into the deal. And, you know, if you think the NFL is going to leave any money on the table, you don't know the NFL like I know the NFL. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'd forgotten about that opt out clause. It's one of those like, oh, we got this player for, you know, the rest of his career. It's like, yes. actually, well, if, if things are going well, you don't read, on, read the fine print. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, so, you know, you'll be talking about the biggest topics in sports media. Um, let's hit some of those right now. Uh, so Tom Brady is there's optimism around him f finalizing his 10% stake in the Raiders. Yeah, right as he begins his broadcasting career. So it looks like from day one, he's going to have these restrictions that we've learned about recently around, you know, his ability to interact with mm. with teams and, you know, be in the clubhouse and um, watch practices. How, how much do you think this is going to be an issue for him to, you know, be both an owner and a media person? You know, I don't think these restrictions are going to be that much of an issue because, you know, let's face it, after seven Super Bowls and 35 playoff wins, you know, Tom Brady can teach them football. You know what I mean? I don't think that he's going to glean some secret that, you know, he didn't learn during his 20 years on the field. I think the bigger issue for Brady is becoming comfortable on TV and able being able to speak in a concise manner. I mean, I'll, I'll point to uh, yesterday's Texas game. They had him on at halftime. And he was a little shaky, I thought. Uh, I thought it was smart by Fox to put him on, you know, kind of get his feet wet. But he was a little shaky at that interview, particularly the sign-off at the end. So I think he just has to get comfortable with the mechanics of TV, a voice talking in your ear, when to speak, when to not, how to come in and out of break. But I think after he gets that down, he'll be fine. We also saw some massive streaming numbers and broadcast numbers for our Thursday and Friday season <laughs> right. openers. Uh, tell us about those, if you will. Uh, you know, the NFL is just a monster. Uh, the kickoff game, which, of course, went down to the wire in true NFL fashion, averaged 28.9 million viewers, uh, peaking at 33 million. I mean, that blows away every other sports telecast. Uh, and it was actually the single most watched kickoff game in 23 years. And then, you know, a night, one night later, the NFL gets 14 million viewers on a streaming only game. You know, that's not even on broadcast. So, yeah, the, the NFL is back in a big way, and uh, we all love it. Also, we got, you know, uh, Sunday morning, we got this crazy news that uh, Tyree Kill was arrested. And not just, you know, like, you know, he gets pulled over for a speeding ticket. He was down on the ground getting handcuffed on his way to the game. Um, it's your thoughts on this whole situation. Well, it was Scotty Scheffler part due, right? Uh, you know, here's a, a superstar going to the game, gets pulled over by the cops for, uh, you know, a, a violation. And the next thing you know, he's cuffed. Uh, you know, uh, I thought Jeff Darlington again, did a fantastic job. This guy seems to be Johnny on the spot. He was right there for Scheffler's arrest. And Darlington of ESPN happened to be working the ESPN, uh, studio show, I mean, uh, the location show for the Dolphins game. So he did a fantastic uh, interview on the field with Drew Rosenhaus, uh, Tyreek Hill's agent, who accused the cops of getting too rough with his client and going, you know, put, putting this thing into a really unnecessary place. So it's it's a fascinating story. There's a lot more that's going to come out. Stephen A. Smith is already weighing in on it. 
So uh, we're going to be talking about this one for the next week or so. Yeah, right. As you know, first I see the headline, I'm like, oh, that's that's kind of crazy. Yeah. And then you start to see the video and the reactions to it and the agent. And it's like, oh, this this one's not just a kind of one and done thing. Yeah, that's like you right. said, I think you'll be talking about it on Tuesday. We'll be talking about this for a little while. And the thing is now, you know, with these police cameras, you know, the truth usually comes out. Uh, you know, in the Scheffler uh, situation, you know what I mean? The stories were so different in the beginning. And it turns out, I think, that Scheffler was telling the truth more than the, the police officers who arrested him. So it, I'm going to be very curious to see uh, what precipitated, you know what I mean, this you know, simple speeding ticket into, uh, you know, as you said, face down on the ground. So tuned in. The event is on Tuesday. We also have the tuned in newsletter is is coming, uh, so you can subscribe twice a week. Right, you'll be getting that's right. Uh, uh, Mike's thoughts and reporting on the sports media world. Yeah, it's a free twice weekly newsletter. The first one talked about Tom Brady's preparation uh, for his new job. We uh, recorded that him and Kevin Burkhardt have in fact cycled through an entire season full of practice games to get ready. Uh, the second tuned in is going to hit. Uh, your inbox on uh, Monday morning. And then, as you said, it's going to be twice weekly from then on out. Yeah. So everyone subscribe. And if you can make it in New York, it's going to be a fantastic event. Mike McCarthy, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Angel Reese will miss the remainder of the WNBA season with a wrist injury, a major blow to the Chicago sky, who are trying to cling to the last playoff spot. That likely cements Caitlin Clark's hold on the Rookie of the Year voting, but Reese held up her end of the rivalry that went from college to the pros this year. She broke the WNBA's records for total rebounds, total offensive rebounds, rebound average, consecutive double-doubles with 15, and total double-doubles for a rookie with 26. The star promised she would be ready for the first iteration of Unrivaled, the three-on-three -three league founded by Brianna Stewart and Nafisa Collier that starts in January. From a rookie season to a final one, Alex Morgan's last game as a professional soccer player brought a full-court press from every NWSL media partner. The game was broadcast by the CBS Sports Network, Paramount+, Plus, Prime Video, ESPN2, NWSL+, Plus, and the local station KUSI. That made the game between the San Diego Wave and North Carolina Courage the first women's sporting event in the U.S. to be shown across multiple outlets simultaneously. Congratulations to Arena Sabalenka and Yannick Sinner for winning these singles titles at the U.S. Open. They defeated Americans Jessica Pagula and Taylor Fritz in their final matches and each take home $3.6 million for their victories. Fritz and Pagula each get half that amount for making it to the finals. We all have two ages, our true age and our biological age. Our bio age suggests how healthy or unhealthy we are inside. You want your bio age years younger than your true age. Let me tell you how Field of Greens is helping me do that. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. The San Francisco 49ers came within a bad bounce from a Super Bowl victory last season, and expectations will be as high as ever this season as they prepare to open against Aaron Rodgers and the New York Jets. My colleague David Rumsey spoke with the team's chief revenue officer, Brent Schaub, on what's going on behind the scenes, and that conversation is next. All right, we are excited to be joined by Brent Schaub, who is the Chief Revenue and Marketing Officer of the 49ers. Uh, just before San Francisco welcomes the New York Jets to the Bay Area for the first Monday night football game of the NFL season. Brent, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you. We're excited to uh, start the season in prime time at Levi's Stadium. It's been a few years since we've done that. So excited to, uh, to bring the Jets here to the, to the Niners to kick off the season. Yeah, 100%. And obviously... Revenue is in your title, Brent. I imagine a primetime matchup like you just mentioned against Aaron Rodgers is good for that. Uh, what has the demand been like for the game locally? 
Yeah, it certainly helps. If we could do prime time every uh, week, that'd be amazing. We'd take it, but certainly to kick off the season, um, obviously Aaron Rodgers is from uh, California, so that helps as well as he went to Cal Berkeley just up the street here. So the game was definitely going to be in high demand uh, irregardless, but the fact that it's our opener on Monday Night Football, uh, we're pretty much all sold out of everything, including all standing room only tickets as well. Coming into this season, obviously, tough finish last year. The 49ers came pretty much as close as a team can to winning the Super Bowl, nearly a double overtime loss. But what is an offseason after a finish like that? What is that offseason like for you on the business side and your team members there? Yeah, good question. It, uh, it was a fun ride all the way to Vegas. Um, I actually just finished the receiver series, which featured uh, Devo and Kittle. And I could not stomach that uh, that last episode still. So still a little fresh. But uh, ultimately, on the business side, uh, we've been humming uh, the best metrics that we've seen. So whether it's uh, our renewal rate on the season ticket member side is at 99% right now as we head into Monday. Uh, our corporate partnership business, our suite business, um, is towards the top of the NFL listing as well. Uh, social and digital channels are in the top five in the NFL as well across the board. So on the business front, certainly uh, really helpful to have that much success on the field. And, and as well this offseason, on the football side of things, the 49ers took a few contract holdouts down to the wire with uh, Brandon IU, Trent Williams. And that's obviously national news for NFL fans, but... Within the organization, Brent, how do those types of situations impact your side of the front office? Yeah, I think, hey, the great news is that we have great leadership, right? Whether it's from our ownership, uh, football side with John Lynch and Coach Shanahan, so certainly helpful uh, in regards to handling those situations. From the business side, I mean, hey, we've got a lot of great players on our roster. Um, there's a hard salary cap league at the end of the day. Uh, but overall, uh, I just saw the notes uh, today, Fanatics came out. And we're number one in retail sales. I believe we have four of the top 50 players on jersey sales as well, which includes a handful of those folks and a handful of folks that were signed uh, earlier in the offseason as well. Looking ahead to the rest of your home schedule, you have, have several other big matchups, including a uh, Super Bowl rematch with the Chiefs Week 7 that's sandwiched back-to-back -back with a visit from the Cowboys, always big. Uh, Brent, how important are those mega matchups for a team's bottom line? Yeah, it's really helpful. I mean, we have, not only do we have a Super Bowl rematch, we have an NFC Championship rematch against the Lions as well. And then the Cowboys, certainly our old rivalry, our own division games as well. It's it's arguably the best home schedule we've had uh, since I've been with the team for, for over 13 years now. So as part of that, um, certainly our team's in demand at this point in time. And you layer out other teams that are in demand from a ticket sales standpoint. Um, and it's certainly uh, catching some wind in our sales. And then at uh, Levi's Stadium, I think the 49ers are, have announced they're spending $200 million on upgrades to Levi's Stadium. Can you take us through what are you doing to keep up with the rest of the league and the facility chase? Yeah, it's been an exciting process. So we're uh, one decade in at Levi's Stadium, which is wild to think. It feels like it was yesterday. Um, but we, um, looking back, really the first 10 years, we hosted Super Bowl 50 early on, CFP National Ch Championship game. Uh, two NFC Championship games here, Taylor Swift, Beyonce, soccer. So really that first 10 years, we saw about $2 billion in economic impact across the Bay Area. And that was really the goal, not only to make it the home of the San Francisco 49ers, but also make this a world-class venue uh, to attract those world-class events in the Bay Area. So really, as we go into year 11 here, uh, starting on Monday, um, this $200 million investment is really to help buoy and launch the next decade at Levi Stadium. So. With that, we're doing things from um, bringing in the largest 4K uh, video boards in the NFL, upgrading our Wi-Fi, our 5G network um, from, a, from a wireless standpoint, uh, renovating suites, adding new premium like most venues are as well. And really with that, we're excited to welcome in Super Bowl 60 in the summer, of, or sorry, in February of 2026, and then also World Cup in the summer of 2026 as well. Um, to really launch that next decade at Levi Stadium. And obviously we're here in the heart of Silicon Valley, so being innovative is important. So all the technology from food and beverage, parking, et cetera, plays into that overall as well. Yeah, and I do want to get to those uh, future events that are coming up here soon. But when you talk about those upgrades, um, certainly not an insignificant amount you're spending. Does the team look at uh, other venues around the country for inspiration, whether it's, you know, down at SoFi Stadium or anywhere else to see what, what fans are really enjoying as far as its uh, video board upgrades, et cetera? 
Yeah, hundred percent. We look at other teams, uh, not only in, in the U.S. but also globally as well. Um, and as part of that, we work with an architect and a general contractor that's worked with multiple other teams also, which helps. And then layering on top our fan survey data in regards to what they're looking for as part of the fan experience, not only for Niners games, but also for these events as well. Transitioning to kind of league-wide topics, the NFL just approved private equity investments in franchises, um, theoretically, or looking down the road, whether it's you or anybody else, how would a private equity investment deal impact the business operations of an NFL franchise? Yeah, it's a great question. I know the details are all shaking out and certain teams are at certain stages um, as part of that. So obviously there's there's an influx of, of dollars that could be put into a team. Um, so at that point, I think that's the biggest part of, of this new uh, policy that came down from the NFL. The 49ers don't... Uh... They, they do have some uh, experience being defending NFC champions coming into a season. So uh, what's the rest of the year look like as you just try to maximize uh, the efforts there locally? Yeah, it's a great question. So now it's, it's, it's ensuring these $200 million in upgrades are really um, hitting home for our fans to make sure that experience both for Niners games and events is, is really hitting home for us um, as part of that. Making sure uh, we're doing everything we can the football, on the business side to help the football side. Uh, get through the season as well. Um, so really, yeah, looking forward to kicking it off on Monday night. Um, felt like a long off season, so really, really excited to be back on the field playing regular season football. Yeah, I think everybody is. So Brent, this has been great to chat about everything that happens off the field in the NFL here around week one. So thanks so much for joining us and best of luck this season. Thank you. Thanks for the time. Appreciate it. The Dallas Mavericks struck a local broadcasting deal after cutting the cord with Diamond Sports Group. The team has a multi-year deal for all of its games that are not on national television with Tegna, an over-the-air broadcaster. The team said that the switch will more than triple the number of Texans able to watch Mavs games from 3.1 million to 10 million. Like the other teams that have gone this route, the Mavs are looking to pair their over-the-air broadcast with a streaming service. It's safe to say that we have our answer to the question of what happens in the near future for NBA and NHL teams that are breaking up with cable. Streaming plus over the air is the new formula until something disrupts this model and changes the game again. The NFL is warning players and teams that they will be cracking down harder on unsafe plays this year. This isn't just a blanket announcement either. The league reached out to more than 20 players and their teams to warn them specifically that safety and sportsmanship violations could result in suspensions, according to ESPN. The players that the league contacted have all been penalized or scrutinized in recent seasons for these sorts of violations. Teams will also be held liable. The NFL removed certain team penalties for player infractions after the pandemic, but those are back now. If players on a team cross $90,000 in total fines, the team will have to pay a matching fine. The broader effort here, of course, is to make a dangerous sport safer. The hip drop tackle is now illegal, and the league is boosting flag football as a lower impact alternative. The NFL has the safest revenues of any league, but it knows that perhaps its greatest long-term danger is athletes picking other sports because football is seen as physically dangerous. Notre Dame paid $1.4 million to embarrass themselves on national TV. The school gave up that sum to play Northern Illinois, part of $35 million in guaranteed payments in week one alone, mostly for games in which power conference schools host group of five or FCS schools. Notre Dame, of course, is independent and has its own contract with NBC. The result was a 16 to 14 upset loss to the Mid-American Conference School, the biggest upset in NIU history. At least they won't be the biggest payout handed out for a game this season. Alabama, Auburn, and Georgia are each paying 1.9 million to WKU, UNM, and UMass respectively this season. The latter two haven't happened yet, but Alabama fared better in its pay to play contest, beating Western Kentucky 63 to zero. Ticketing is in a moment of transition as legislation and lawsuits challenge Ticketmaster's dominance and new challengers try to carve out their place in the market. I spoke to Sports Illustrated Ticket CEO David Lane on the opportunity he sees in that industry. I'm joined now by Sports Illustrated Ticket CEO David Lane. Welcome, David. Thank you for having me on. How are you doing? Great, great to have you on. So SI Tickets launched in June 2021, right around when things were really starting to open back up. Where did you see an opportunity in the ticketing space? I think today fans are disenchanted with the other ticket marketplaces that are out there. I don't think anybody has an I love StubHub bumper sticker on the back of their car. 
And so we look at the opportunity as Sports Illustrated begins to evolve of introducing something to our tens of millions of fans that they're already doing. They're going to games, they're going to concerts, introducing tickets isn't going to feel like it doesn't belong. And so here comes Sports Illustrated. Trust and credibility, 70 years, iconic, same tickets to the same events, no transaction fees, transparent pricing. Even if we're at the same price, we think we can earn your business. We think you're looking for someone other than our competitors to buy your next pair of tickets from. And I understand you guys have a primary and secondary market. And, you know, secondary is often where we see the crazy, crazy prices. Is that where you guys can, you know, make more money for a big event, you know, like the Super Bowl? Look, the 1% of the Taylor Swift and the Beyonce's and the Super Bowl, they're very competitive marketplaces. And I think probably the most visible, most, most public frustrations for fans as well as to what these price, but these are open marketplaces. You know, a buyer and a seller are determining a price that that fan is willing and able to pay. If ticket prices are sky high, it's because people are still willing to pay. There's no marketplace in the world, free market in the world that continues to outprice what the demand is willing to pay. So if fans are looking for those prices to come down, that seller, which we have, you know, tens of thousands of sellers on our site every day, they need to move that price down to where this, the buyer is looking to buy it. And so this is, a, this is like any other retail marketplace. We're bringing buyers and sellers together. And I think as you look at the average cost of tickets since the pandemic, 22, 23, elevated, right? Coming out, we all wanted to get back out there. 24 is normalizing. And so we're starting to see average sale prices in that pair of tickets around $300. It was easily above $400 this time in 22 and 23. Okay. Yeah. I was actually going to ask if they, this is just one of those things that's just going to keep going up for a while, but it sounds like it actually has gone down this year. It's normalizing, right? I think the way that we look at the pre-pandemic and what you're, you know, look, you have, a, you make a lot of money, you want to spend it do things that are going to be exciting, have experiences. I think coming out of the pandemic, we all wanted to get back out to these live events and these experiences. And now we're starting to look at, well, look, we don't have that amount of income available to pay these prices or go to that many different events. But what we're seeing on the live event side is the number of shows and the number of, we'll call them different categories of events that are skyrocketing and variety and across the globe, you know, you get an Olympic year that elevates the excitement of fans to be able to see something that they don't get every single Tuesday or Wednesday in their hometown. So the live event market continues to expand. The number of events out there continues to grow. And I think for fans, the, the moment that we're all having as fans is we want to be able to afford to be able to see our favorite artist or go see our team play in a game. And that's what the markets need to tr truly do a better job of. Be transparent, show the fan what they're going to pay. Let them make it, they're an educated consumer. Let them make an educated decision on where they want to buy those to, and how much they're going to pay. Why wait to the very last step of the checkout to deliver after DNA samples and firstborn have been given? Let the consumer see at the very top this is what the cost is. Make an educated decision. That's how our, that's our view. That's why we think Sports Illustrated tickets can be successful. The Department of Justice is suing to break up the merger of Ticketmaster and Live Nation. Do you agree with the DOJ? What the DOJ is saying to the marketplace is they're looking for fair, equal, they want competition. And I think today for Live Nation and Ticketmaster as a combined organization, they are very capable very powerful and the leader in the world of what they've been able to build for 30 years. But the prices of the tickets and the, the fans willing to pay that price is determined by the buyer and the seller at the end of the day. Ticketmaster is a marketplace. And so if the fan it doesn't want and can't afford to pay that ticket, they're not going to. And so I think the way that we look at the opportunity for us in this marketplace today 
as all the other ticket marketplaces that are out there, the, the sooner that transparency can come to all of us, the better for every fan in every market around the world. And so I think if there's any outcome that I would love to see most, it's transparency. We talked about this earlier, Owen. Tell me, what's my price? Tell me up front. If, if all the marketplaces, all of them could be equal, in being able to be transparent and let the fan make an educated decision. I think that's the best for all of us. All right. Sounds good. David Lane, thanks so much for joining us on the show. It's great to be here. Owen. Thank you. It's time for FOS Tomorrow, where we look ahead to the biggest things happening in the business of sports. It looks like Bill Belichick's career in media may be short-lived. ESPN reports that the legendary coach is looking to make his return to the sidelines next season, provided he can find the right situation and the right job. Belichick temporarily retired from coaching at the end of last season after he parted ways with the New England Patriots, with whom he won six Super Bowl championships in his 24 years as the head man. The market was expected to be stronger for the winningest coach in NFL history, but the best offers were a handful of decorated assistant roles. So Belichick pivoted over to media, and much like his counterpart Tom Brady, he came in with a massive leg up. Belichick is already an important part of ESPN's NFL coverage, making weekly appearances both on Monday Night Football's Manning cast and the Pat McAfee show. He'll also be hosting a weekly studio show with Peyton Manning. One thing is clear, whether Belichick returns to coaching next year, the following year, or never, he's going to be an important and ever-present part of the NFL landscape for years to come. That's it for today. We want to hear from you. Send us your thoughts on the big stories in sports by emailing today at frontofficesports.com, and we might read your comments on the show. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.